this on and we are ready to present your next run that's uh, Anodyne 2 uh, Return to Dust presented by Code Gorilla. Hello everyone, I am Code Gorilla. I'm going to be running, as mentioned, Anodyne 2 Return to Dust. This is the sequel to the uh, indie game Anodyne, although I use the term sequel very loosely. It's uh, mostly just thematic and some stylistic connections. Um, you can really play the games in any order. The, the devs say as much in the first 10 seconds of the game. Uh, joining me today on commentary is Daff Dillion, or Daff. Uh, Daff, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Daff. Uh, I speedrun... I used to speedrun even the ocean, and I muck about in the Anodyne server. I'm just going through the settings real quick here. Uh, everything looks good. We are going to be playing this run in simplified Chinese because it has the shortest text. And there's a lot of text in this game. Thankfully, there's a text skip option, so we don't have to do a lot of text mashing. But uh, we definitely want to uh, want to have as little text as possible, uh, even for as fast as the text goes. And you'll see how fast it really goes. Um, the one other thing I want to say as a disclaimer before we get this run started, there's a trick that we use in several places throughout the run called pause gliding. Uh, it involves rapidly pausing and unpausing the game in order to extend the horizontal distance of a glide in the air. Um, if you are sensitive to rapidly cycling screens, consider this a photosensitivity warning. I'll try to warn you as the specific times we're going to do it comes up, just in case. Uh, but I uh, just thought I should give that disclaimer before we actually get started. Uh, with that out of the way, I believe uh, I'm ready to go. Daff, you good? Yep. Yeah. Alright, then let's count down from five. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. One, go. And right off the bat here, we start with a cutscene. Uh, we're actually going to skip the second half of this cutscene by jumping out of the cutscene trigger as soon as we gain control of our character. That looks a little something like this. And there we go. And from that, we go straight into the tutorial of the game. Um, this gives us a basic idea of the core gameplay loop of the game. Uh, the idea is you explore the 3D world to find 2D worlds. You explore the 2D worlds to find collectibles, usually cards and dust, uh, and you turn in those cards and dust to unlock more parts of the 3D world, rinse and repeat. Now coming up here we're going to do our first uh, glitch of the run. Uh, this is why we're playing on the Switch version, by the way, because the thing we're about to do is only on the Switch version. Uh, that is known as a pause float. Uh, the way that works is if you jump and immediately pause, you actually maintain your momentum while you're in the air. Uh, so you can gain arbitrary amounts of height that way uh, and go as high as you want. As you can imagine, that's fairly useful, although not as useful as you might expect given half this game is 2D where that doesn't apply. Uh, we're going to do another one here to give you a better idea of how this works. We're going to go straight over this mountain. One, two, three. Just like that. And we'll get into the third and final part of the tutorial. Yeah, if you want to give a, uh, a vague idea of what's going on here in the story while I finish out the tutorial here. Um, yeah, you're in... Right now you're in the album Shore, which is... Where Nova is born? Oh my god, I don't remember anything about the story of this game. <laughs> um, and she's meeting the Yorks to... Um, 
Is it to get the seed? Yes. So it's, yes. yeah, our goal is to get this seed by collecting, uh, I think they're called the elements of nurturing in the lore of the game, but I like to call them the elements of a balanced breakfast. You get a bowl of cereal, you get a bottle of milk, and you get a temperature regulator because you don't want to be too cold for your breakfast. Um, so true. Um, and you get the glandulox seed, which tells you how you're doing, I guess. Yeah. It's like a control center for your brain. I said that in a very ominous way. <laughs> Uh, I mean, foreshadowing. Uh, foreshadowing, so true. <laughs> um, now, what is normally supposed to happen next is a tutorial boss. We're actually going to skip the tutorial boss, because they try to force you to fight the tutorial boss by locking you in with invisible walls. But they didn't think to give you an invisible ceiling, so we're going to pause float right on out of here. Uh, like this... Three, four, five. Oh, I got caught on something. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, the game doesn't like me tonight. One, two, three, four. That, yeah, that's plenty good enough. There we go. First try. I actually haven't seen this before. I've only watched the PC version of this run. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, this pause floating uh, trick is only in the Switch version of the game. Um, before it was discovered, I, I did run the PC version and you had to actually go through the boss fight there. But also there's this. Uh, this is save floating. Uh, it works the exact same way as pause floating, but you use the save dialog. You might notice when I did that loss pause float, I uh, changed some options around. I had to turn off the text skip so that this dialog box stays in place. Now I'm going to do a pause glide here, so uh, photosensitivity warning. Just like this. Got to turn that text skip back on. Do a couple more quick pause glides. And yeah, uh, so a lot just happened there. Uh, I floated into the air, I went out of bounds, outside of the city, there's this debug platform uh, that has a bunch of... Mm, that doesn't look right, hang on. Oh, we'll see if that's right in a minute. Uh, something seems like it might have gone wrong, but we will uh, confirm when I get into the next level. Uh... Oh, no, that's right. I'm actually just thinking of a later spot. Never mind. We're good. We're good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, that, so that trick is only on the Switch version. Um, and that lets you get out of bounds to that platform, which is a debug platform that has a couple of different cutscene triggers on them. And by driving through them in a specific way, you can actually stack two different cutscenes on top of each other. And also, using those, you can uh, trigger cutscenes that you're not supposed to be able to trigger because you don't have the resources yet. Um, so, we just did a lot of stuff very early. Now, it doesn't help as much as you might think, uh, partially because this is an all cards run. So, we still have to go collect the cards that we normally would have used to fix the prism, which is one of the things we did there. Um, but also because for the midpoint of the game, uh, no matter what, you need all 12 cards that are available to you at that point. So the early parts of the game, you still have to collect all the cards. And in any case, and in any uh, this is Mysterio Wise. Sorry, did you have something there? Um, yeah, like if you if you look at the um, the any percent bad ending version of this run, you you just activate the one of the cutscenes like five times, and then you're like, yeah, GG. Yeah, um, I admit I, that is the one category of this game I have not run <laughs> yet. Um, uh, because it's 
it's cool that the glitches exist, but that particular category is not super entertaining. Uh, I much more enjoy this more completionist run, uh, where you get to actually see all the parts of the game. But I should do that run sometime just for, uh, just for fun. I imagine it doesn't take terribly long. Nah, it's 22 minutes yeah. or something like that. Okay, I just have a little reminder that uh, we also have uh, donation incentives for Indithon and uh, next up is uh, 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 laundry hamper therapy for a room any percent run uh, the uh, laundry hamper uh, is having the worst time in of any appliance in the house and uh, I I'm quite interested in uh, what will happen so uh, if you are too so feel free to donate to the indie phone and uh, make sure to choose uh, this uh, donation incentive uh, in the uh, donation form So I just want to point out there, we uh, there was a boss at the end of that section. Um, we absolutely just skipped it. The way the bosses work, at least for the early part of this game, uh, when you enter the screen, you haven't fully entered the boss arena. And until you fully enter the boss arena, the gates that block the entrance and exit to the room don't appear. Uh, one, two, three... Uh, so, as a result, if you can actually hit the boss from the very entrance way, um, and then walk into the room while the boss is going through its hit stun animation, the boss never closes the entrance and exit, and you can just walk right on past. This glitch is fun because there was a long period of, like, People found out that you could do it on the first Nano Assassin fight, and then and then they discovered you could do it on the other fights. But then, if if you do it on the Nano, the first one, then it soft locks you. Yeah, the the one that we there, skipped. Um, sorry, go ahead. And there's there's just like a long history of runners trying to figure out which ones you could actually skip. And it turns out so. the one that we first thought we couldn't skip, and then we thought we could skip, and then we thought we couldn't skip, turns out we actually can skip on the Switch version by just never entering that area in the first place. Ah, uh, yes. The Nano Assassin skip, 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 <laughs> skip. Uh, this is Brand Malignant. As you might have guessed, the theme here is fire. Uh, there's just... Fire used in all sorts of interesting ways. Like here I'm setting some slimes on fire. Um, there's also some precise cycles in uh, in this area. I always forget about the one where you throw the slime at the fire to make it go faster. Yeah, it's there's a couple of spots where you have to move very quickly to get the earliest possible cycle with these fire shooters. Here's another example, where if you do this very quickly, you can get get it in two shots. That second one, the problem I always run into is I accidentally stand in the path of the fire shooter after it shoots, and it hits me instead of hitting the gate it needs to hit. Which isn't very helpful. Uh, this boss is also theoretically skippable, but the positioning, as far as I've been able to tell, is like sub-pixel perfect. Nope, oh, didn't pick up the box there. Um, and it doesn't save that much time over an optimal boss fight. Uh, although, admittedly, that was not quite an optimal boss fight. Um, so, like, I, I usually make a half-hearted attempt at going for it, because it's free to attempt, but... You rarely ever actually get it in a run.
All right, time for another big pause float. Uh, how do you guys like counting? Because we're going to do a lot of counting right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24. Uh, and I got caught on... Alright, I had a bad angle there, unfortunately. And I got caught on the thing. So, we're gonna go for backup strats. Where I just head over here. And we're gonna do another save float. Uh, I needed to turn off tech skip anyways for an upcoming thing. So, we'll just take this instead. Because this is, this is guaranteed because we get to control exactly when we drop out of this. Uh, that is the problem with the pause float sometimes, is you have to get some precise angles for some of them, and you don't get to see what you're doing until you unpause. Uh, anyways, pause glide incoming, so photo sensitivity warning. And we're heading out to this platform again. This time we're going to drive through two slightly different cubes so that we can turn in our dust and turn in cards that we don't actually have at the same time. For the next part of the game, uh, the next requirement basically is that we have all 12 cards and 200 dust in the tank, or 200 dust between the prism and our tank. Um, so we have to turn in dust a couple of times because our tank only holds 90. Uh, we'll be turning in dust one more time, but in the meantime, uh, here's Gustine Capellum. Gotta turn tech skip back on. Uh, it was underneath the balcony there, so I had to redo that pause float, unfortunately, but it happens. And yeah. Something we haven't talked about is most of these 2D sections start with this sort of rhythm mini game that you see here. Uh, I believe it's called a Dimension Dive mini game, if I'm remembering correctly. It has been a it long is. time. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. I think that's the track yeah. name in the soundtrack. It's been a long time since I have uh, played this game with text that goes at a readable speed in a language that I understand. <laughs> um, the curses of speedrunning a game, you know? Uh, it's still one of my favorites of all time. But yeah, Gustine Pelham. Uh, the theme here is tongues, uh, which are thankfully a lot more cartoony than uh, Gustine's exterior, because uh, if it wasn't, that would be absolutely horrifying. Uh, instead, it just uh, is very pink. If you were looking for anything that's the same consistency as Gust as Gustine's uh, 3D model, there's something coming up for you later in the game. There sure is. In any case, this area is relatively straightforward. I'm going to take a wide loop around those spikes because it's easy to get pinned in the upper left corner if you are not careful. Uh, some precise movement in an upcoming screen is going to get through this screen very quickly. I'm just going to set up there, and before you even know it, we're off that screen. Uh, if you go very precisely, you can actually defeat that enemy with the opening of the gate, rather than having to close it again. Anyways, here's another boss. Uh, that's not great. Uh, there is no way to skip this boss, because of this wall that's in the middle. Uh, and I have missed a few too many of my shots. So you get to see what happens when you run out of boxes in the arena. Thankfully, the boss will provide more ammunition. 
and we can move right along. Okay, I just would like to uh, say a little word about uh, in this one is a uh, free annual charity event showcasing all types of uh, indie games and uh, we are happy to see you on this marathon. If uh, you would like to see more events feel free to follow uh, uh, this channel and also feel free to follow uh, Code Gorilla. he has just uh, two followers uh, up to 100 <laughs> and uh, if you uh, like this run, uh, make sure to go to his uh, Twitch channel and click follow button. Well, I do very much appreciate that. Uh, something you just saw there, I absolutely just clipped through a wall. Uh, that is called Right Scale Clipping. Uh, right Scale is the name of your card form. There's, there's, I, I guess it's just scale when you're in your human form. Uh, there's nano scale when you go into 2D and then there's ride scale when you're in your car form um and the thing is the ride scales hitbox is slightly larger than your human hitbox uh and as a result and because of the way it interacts with the camera direction if you wedge yourself into the corner spin the camera just right and transform at the right time you'll clip right through the wall um it's it's actually remarkably easy to do especially in that first corner it's very shallow so it's very easy to do it there uh we have a slightly more difficult one coming up as we get out of this 2d area this is the great guam um not a whole lot of theming going on here we just have these new enemies called mini guams uh they're just mounds of dirt that move around and then when you walk over them, they poke their head out of the dirt, and then you can interact with them like a normal enemy. But the mounds of dirt don't hurt you, so you can just safely walk over them like that. Um, we also have some dark rooms in the upper path here. Uh, the gimmick to these dark rooms is they're exact same as the light rooms that you came from, except with these red ropes removed so that you can actually get past. So it's, it's a bit of a memory test, basically. Do you remember the room layout? Thankfully, yes, I do. Uh, okay, coming up here, this room bothers me um, because the electric slime enemies in this room and in no other spot in the game cannot actually be inhaled by your vacuum, and I don't know why, uh, and it would actually speed things up to be able to inhale them, but for some reason, those specific enemies, you cannot. Uh, we've got another boss skip here, just like that, nice and easy. I had to wait for the mini Guam to actually get close to me to be able to uh, get the ammunition I needed, but other than that, piece of cake. We also did kill the entire Guam family because we're heartless. Uh, we left one survivor to tell the tale, you know. One incredibly traumatized survivor. I... I we're... but we're the good guys, right? <laughs> Are we? Mm, and I'm too, we the Anyways, uh, here's that other ride scale clip I mentioned. That's a harder one to get. Uh, more pause lighting. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. We're good. I made it over the ledge. That's what matters. And we're going to turn in dust. This is the intended way to turn in dust, or one of them. There's these little devices where you can plug in your vacuum cleaner and empty the dust into the prism. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Alright, and now, we've got a brief little cutscene here, um, and coming up is the most important pause glide 
in the game, and also the longest fog glide in the game. Um, you want to talk about this, uh, uh, Jeff Skip here coming up? Um, Jeff Skip is when you climb to the top of this car wash and you grab a card because there's a card here, and then you pause glide to there, there's a guy in a hole. Um, and we don't want to go down into the hole because that's a whole, uh, <laughs> that's a whole section that we don't want to go to. <laughs> so we, um, come to this village at the top of the hole instead and do this 2D section, which is still the same 2D section that you would get if you were at the bottom of the hole. Um, but you skip the climb all the way down. You also skip the rhythm mini game, uh, which is a huge time save because those are essentially auto scrollers. There is no way to speed them up other than just don't mess up. But yeah, as we're going through here, you can see this area is kind of dull and it's got these sepia tones going on and everything's dead and there's no music. Uh, our goal here is to clean up and read the gravestones as we pass by and kind of piece together what may have happened here. And then we're going to finish this area, but there's not going to be a dust crystal at the end. Instead, there's going to be a warp out. And this is how you're normally supposed to get to this structure. Now, I'm going to do another pause float here. One, two, three, four. And we re-enter. This is the same spot we just entered a moment ago, uh, just with an awkward camera angle. And now we're in the same area, but it's now alive. Um, our goal Banger. now is to talk to all the NPCs that used to be gravestones. Banker song alert also. Uh, we do also make this detour to turn in this key that we picked up on the first pass because at the end of this path there is a card and we need all of them. So we just got these turret enemies um, to take two hits to deal with. Yeah, we got our card. Now we can get back on the main path. Just got to make sure to actually talk to the right NPCs. You don't have to talk to every NPC, thankfully. Just the ones that used to be gravestones. Except for this one coming up here. This is Jeff. We never talk to Jeff. In 2D or in 3D, he just gets ignored. Rest in peace, Jeff. Poor Jeff. Poor Jeff. Alright. We got some cutscenes here that are building up some... Uh, intrigue as to what one of our parental figures might be doing. Uh, and now we're down in this hole. Let's get out of the hole. Three, four. Turn into a car. Uh, as you can probably imagine, car form is faster than human form for any sort of horizontal distance. Um, if I'm not in car form, it's either because I need to go up or because the game won't let me be in car form. Uh, speaking of which, there's a secret behind this waterfall. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to pause glide over to it. One, two, three, and pause glide away from it. That was, of course, another card. We've got a couple more pause glides coming up. One off of this freeway. 
that rail is just a suggestion. We're gonna end up in this lake. As mentioned, uh, I don't turn into a car here because the game won't let me. Welcome to the fishbowl. Some more pog gliding. Just skip to this upper platforms and one last pog glide. It's not strictly necessary, but it looks cool. And this is Iwasaki Antimon. Uh, and my favorite thing about Iwasaki Antimon is that uh, his name has the same meter as Camptown Races, so you can go Iwasaki Antimon, Duda, Duda. Do you actually do that? Occasionally. Look, oh. it's 2.30 in the morning. What do you want from me? It is 2.30 in the morning. But, like, you have to have premeditated. <laughs> like, one simply doesn't come up with the knowledge that that scans. <laughs> Look, you do enough runs of this game and you just, you start to find these things. Uh, anyways, yeah, it was Antimon. The theme here, as you can probably guess, is snow and ice. Um, you have these snow slimes that break apart into snowballs. These spinning ice enemies. Uh, and you have the scariest enemy in the game, I would argue. Or at least the most threatening, which are the snowmen. Um, they have a horrifying klaxon noise when you get near them. They will chase you down relentlessly, they explode on contact, and unlike everything else in the game, they do two points of damage instead of one. Um, they are actually, like, the only other thing that does that much damage at once is the final boss. Thankfully, you do move slightly faster than them, so as long as you are a little bit careful, you can outrun them. And now we've gotten to the point where those snowmen, those those snowmen are friendly. They aren't going to attack us. And now, the exit to this area is up to the left there, but we of course need to make another detour for a bonus card. Uh, because none of the cards, again, are optional. This is all cards. So we have to descend back into the snow fields. Uh, I will say the snowmen, uh, I've been pretty good with health here, but the snowmen do make this one of the areas where you actually have to be a little bit concerned about your health in this game. Uh, for the most part, walking over any save point will save the game and give you a full heal. Uh, so you don't have to worry too much about health in most spots. Uh, but this is one of the spots where it can matter. Now we've got a brief detour into 3D. If you were playing this casually, you could uh, examine that house to get more lore about Iwasaki's Antimon's... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, idol? Yeah, idol. Someone he looks up to very much. Uh, that said... We're speedrun. We're, we're not here for lore, unfortunately. There's a lot of good lore in this game. I really enjoyed the story and narrative of this game. And I highly recommend you play this for yourself casually uh, to get that lore and story. Um, but we will not be experiencing much of it today. What's lore? What's a story? <laughs> I'm just saying the lore in the story is the reason I fell in love with this game. Um, it is very good. And then the fact that the speedrun is actually pretty fun uh, does help. This is actually the first ever game I speedran. One, two, three, four. Oh wow, really? Six. I didn't know that. Yeah. 
Uh, more fog gliding here, by the way. Just need to go over this mountain. And we are already at our next 2D area. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the game that got me into speedrunning. Um, I first speedran this in... Uh, it must have been early 2021. So not that long ago. I've not been in speedrunning for very long. Or at least not into speedrunning as a speedrunner. I enjoyed watching speedruns beforehand, but hadn't done one of my own. I like this as a run. It has just the right mix of just learning some cool tricks uh, and then also just learning good execution. It, it's got a healthy mix of both. Uh, I I think it's a very beginner-friendly speedrun. Um, speaking as someone who was a beginner when he started running this game, so uh, I will also say, in addition to you should play this for the story, you should play this for the speedrun. It's a lot of fun. In any case, this is Clonway, uh, Clonway Yonstein, uh, quote unquote brother of Lonway Yonstein. Um, in my opinion, this is the most difficult 2D area in Blue Veil, uh, just because there's a lot of precise movements and it's very easy to make a small mistake that forces you to completely reset a room. The gimmick of this area is that you have, um, I think Conway's shadow or Conway in Conway's mind, um, and you need a and he mirrors your actions, and you need to like make him touch buttons on the other side of the screen. It's very confusing. Yeah, yeah it definitely takes some wrapping your head around, uh, especially as we get into this section and they introduce teleporters that have you swap places with Clonway and. Uh, things get very weird. Uh, but the main obstacle here is the red jam that fills the space. And if any shadow thing touches the red jam, it is instantly destroyed. Also, banger alert again. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love the music in this game. This is, like, top three tracks for me in this game. Um... This one's called Sparkle Sparkle Neuromates. Yeah, the names of the uh, the soundtrack are also just all very good. Um, I believe. So yeah, uh, we're just making our way through um, Clonway here. Uh, host, if you have anything you'd like to plug, now would be a good time. Oh, oh um, I just uh, would like to say a quick word uh, about uh, our uh, uh, prizes. Yeah. Uh, Actually, uh, while donating to in this one, you have a chance to win some uh, awesome prizes, uh, including uh, in this one pack, which has a copy of the Escapist 2 and Worms uh, WMD uh, Cute Friends pack uh, with uh, copies of Monster Sanctuary and Yoko's Island Express uh, Peace Run Starter pack. Uh, uh, with copies of uh, Great Greek Memories and uh, of uh, of Azure and Super Macbot, and uh, other prizes. Uh, feel free to check out the donation page uh, and support the Indithon, and uh, also uh, uh, Codwell Children. Uh, and thank you for watching and following us. Uh, it's uh, also very important. Uh, we are happy to do all these runs for you. Alright, so coming up we've got an interesting portion of the game. Um, uh, 
so our main character, one, two, hit. Ooh, I got caught on the gate. One, two. This is what I get for trying to go over the gate and not through the gate. Um, we're going to undergo a little bit of trauma here, is the, the easiest way for me to put this. Uh, and what that means from the mechanical gameplay perspective um, is we're going to be slowed down and staggering for a little bit. We're going to fall down, we're going to get back up, um, and we're going to take eight slow steps. And during those eight slow steps, we cannot turn into a car. Uh, and then after those eight slow steps, we can turn back into a car normally. Um, but there's a catch. Uh, there's an invisible timer going on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, until you automatically drop out of car form, fall over, and have that slow animation again. Uh, but if you change screens like that uh, before that timer runs out, you can reset the timer and stay in car form. Now, on this screen in particular, it's a very tight path you have to follow. And I just barely did not make it. It's so tight that I can't usually tell until I'm on the screen. Uh, Alright, some pause spam incoming to get over this rail. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and and if, if you want to know how our mom is, um, we're, we're not answering that question. <laughs> everything's fine. Yeah, sure, everything's fine. We're just hungry. Yeah, that's it. We're just hungry. That's why you see our character, uh, our character Nova, uh, uh, clutching her stomach. That She's just hungry. Right? Yeah, she, all, all she had to eat today was a bowl of s cereal and some milk. Yeah, that would make anyone hungry, you know. We've done a lot of hard work in the last, okay, 40 minutes, but still. Just working up a good appetite. Alright, we've got some more... So this is an interesting part where... Touching that yellow sigil uh, inverted this tower, so we can now fall up the tower. That's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to avoid walking on the ground any, because, again, that timer I mentioned still applies, and we still don't want to fall over. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to make a precise jump here to avoid falling over just before entering that doorway, and then again just <gasps> after. Two, three, four... Five. Do another pause float there to get up here. There we go. And we're going to try to enter this fruit, uh, but the dog is going to come along and eat it. So instead, we're going to enter the dog. And ironically, this is the hardest part of the game. Yeah. It gets easier once you realize that it always jumps to the same places in the same order. There's actually extremely little RNG in this game. Um, but it still takes some getting used to its pattern. So, a minor thing that comes up in a couple spots in this section. Um, Cutscene spawning displacement. I, I don't know if there's a catchy name for this one. But basically... I'm holding down, down and right on my control pad right now. Um, and when I load into the next cutscene, there's a brief moment before the scene is even fully loaded in where I actually have control of my character and can start moving before it freezes me in place. So I should have started next to the bed there, and I got a head start on my movement because I was already holding down and right. That comes up in a couple of spots. It's relatively minor. Um... But it's also the only real, like, tech to this area, other than just knowing where to go and what to do. Speaking of where to go and what to do, uh, this is Dustbound Village. Um, and so, in this portion of the game, our character is kind of cut off from everything they knew, and... Uh, processing some stuff 
uh, just a whole lot of stuff right now. Um, and ends up kind of just falling into a new routine here in Dustbound Village. And what that means in terms of gameplay is uh, in Dustbound Village here, we're going to have three different kinds of segments repeated multiple times to give you an impression of Nova's routine. Um, the three segments are, we have gardening segments, we have ritual segments, and we have wrestling segments. Um, and we'll kind of talk about each of those as we get into them. Um, first up, I've got another cutscene spawn displacement. Um, this one's kind of important because, as you can see, I'm moving very slowly. Uh, I think you actually move at full speed before the screen fully loads in, so you get a significant head start there. And see, That's we were hungry. We were hungry. We were just hungry all she finally got. She finally got some soup. Uh, so this is gardening. Uh, this looks very similar to the 2D gameplay you've already seen so far. Uh, it's the most similar to what we've already done. It's called gardening because these are weed enemies that have infested the garden. Uh, I think they're called weederons, something like that. Um, and our job is to deal with them so that the village has healthy crops and food to eat. Uh, fairly straightforward. Hey, Code Girl, what's that name of that bug-looking character in the pink and the green? I have no idea. Oh, I, oh, I oh no. Oh, sorry. You mean the actually <laughs> important one, not the stick bug character that's at... Uh, that's LGBT. LGBT. Um, she's great. I love her. I love all the characters. All the characters that... Uh, I actually remember the names of. There's one character in the background of the funeral scene that we saw a moment ago. That's the only time you see that character. They look like they're more important than they actually are, because they get a unique sprite and everything, but um, they are just background character. Anyways, here's wrestling. This is the most important part of this whole game. Uh, so these are kind of like fake staged boss fights. Uh, where you have to pretend to hit and get hit. Uh, and we've got a quick time event where we do some of these. Uh, we don't want to see B inputs because they take slightly longer than any other input. They have a longer animation. And if you're watching the meter on the left side, the last input is always a Y input, so you can mash ahead of time. Um... So yeah, that was our first wrestling segment. Um, I didn't really explain the mechanics of that too much, but basically you have to pull your punches. So you aim a shot at the enemy, at your opponent, um, and then let go of the fire button right as it's near the opponent. Um, I usually aim just to the side of the opponent to make those easier. Uh, but yeah. This is our second and final gardening section. There's only two gardening sections. Um, but yes, that was the character you were mentioning earlier. I don't know why I was thinking the other one. Again, I go back to, it's it's nearly 3 a.m. here. I thought you were setting up for an elaborate joke. If you don't mind, I have a quick word about uh, persons who support us. <laughs> Absolutely, go for it. Uh, so, uh, Indie Phone is supported by OK Joy, an independent uh, indie game developer based in China. Their Metroidvania inspired retro action platformer HAAK uh, has just released on Steam. Set in an apocalyptic uh, wasteland, you'll need to develop your skills, fight mysterious organizations, solve mysteries, and explore the wasteland in order to survive and to embrace the world's ultimate secret. Visit their Steam page and join their Discord uh, for more information. Sounds interesting. I'll have to check it out myself. Maybe tomorrow after I've gotten some sleep, though. 
Oh. No, come back here. Ah. The finale for all these wrestling segments is unique. This time we stun our opponent and just suck him up and shoot him out of the ring. Uh, you can actually do... I, if, I wish I had remembered to do it, but you can actually do cutscene spawn displacement for this cutscene. Uh, it has no gameplay effect whatsoever, but you can make your character pretend to be looking at the tree instead of the obvious important things going on in the scene. That's it. We've got one more ritual section, which I haven't really talked about yet. Um, they're all fairly similar. It's all always walk to the train station, take the train, uh... Roll the dice, cross the rickety bridge, and send some sort of sacrifice down the slide. We sent a bowl of soup down the slide. We sent uh, a rose from our crush down the slide. Uh, and we've got one more thing to sacrifice down the slide coming up shortly. So yes, that's totally a train. Absolutely, perfectly normal train. Nothing unusual about it. I love public transportation. Yeah, it's great. Roll the dice, cross the rickety bridge, and send a sacrifice of ourselves down the slide. Hey, do you ever think about how sad this game is? Oh, all the time. But it's also really charming. And we're going to get the good ending, so it kind of works out. This is the third and final wrestling segment. Uh, it has my favorite, but also hardest to do fast segment here, what I call the DDD section. We'll see why in just a moment if you've ever played any Kirby games. Didn't get the two cycle, but three is pretty good. And then energy tennis. But you can kind of cheese it by just standing next to him and mashing. Uh, and now we've got the longest cutscene in the game. Uh, this is where I like to get up and take a quick stretch. If you're feeling cheeky, you can run to the kitchen and grab a drink here. It's about two minutes of cutscene, although I complicate things by splitting in the middle of this cutscene. It's so important to watch your posture and stay hydrated. Absolutely. Yep. Stretch break for everyone in the audience, too. But yeah, at this point, we have decided... We can't handle what's going on here. We've had enough. And we're just going to bring it all crashing down. And we're just going to leave. Now, thankfully, after we leave, someone, uh, we kind of pass out and someone finds us and we are brought back to the center. We, we are introduced to a new character. Um, we have our parental units. We had Palisade and Sea Psalmist. Um, Palisade is the one who is no longer here. Uh, and this is Sea Visionary, who is... Interesting. Horrible is the word that yeah, I Yeah, horrible use. is a good word. Uh, is really here to make you reconsider your life choices up to this point. Um, in any case, this is... So I've mentioned a couple of times that this is an all-cards run. Uh, and... This is where the run actually diverges from the any percent. The first 50 minutes of it are actually exactly the same. Um, if we were doing 
any percent, we would actually be going to do a little bit of a dust grind and then just running to the few things we need to pick up to actually trigger the ending of the game. The good ending, which is what we're doing. But instead, we have 12 extra cards that we have to pick up along the way. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to get all the dust we need, so we don't need to grind dust, thankfully. Um, I think this is one of the few games where um, good ending is faster than bad ending. Yeah. Also, here's a, here's a normal NPC. That's completely normal. Yeah, no, this is completely normal. Um, meet the dolphin. Uh, Alright, let's see if I can get this in one try. Gonna focus. Focus. Gonna focus. I believe in you. <laughs> Completely Amazing. normal. <laughs> Those Pedrana skills. <laughs> so, you may have surmised by now that something weird is going on. Getting to this section actually freaked me out so much in my first playthrough that I was like, is this a bot? Oh, Do absolutely. It's, it's so... I don't, I don't know the word to describe it even. It's so something. It's just, it's so. Period. Full stop. It's also maybe like the best part of this game. Yeah, no, I, especially if you actually take the time to read all the text and think about it. Um, it's very fun. Anyways, uh, this is Nora. Welcome to Her Boring Life. Uh, and the reason I say that is because that is the name of the track that is playing right now. Uh, we gotta remember our pathing leaving this apartment building. Left, up, right, up, U-turn, right, up, and U-turn. There we go. You can technically muddle your way through that, but I believe that is the fastest way to get through. Anyways, we're going to check social media and we're going to go to bed. Social media had nothing interesting for us today. Oh, let me check uh, for a second. Oh, actually... Um... We can say another word uh, for support to Team 17. Sure. Uh, Indifo in Indithon Follies is supported by Team uh, 17 who recently announced the continuation of Moving Out franchise. Moving Out 2 will be coming to PC, Xbox Series X and S, Sony PlayStation 4 and 5, and Nintendo Switch in 2023, and will feature online play. Make uh, sure to check out Moving Out 2. So, I do very much appreciate that update, uh, but I am sorry, I think I misled you. Our character was checking social media. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's still a good update. Um, any case, what would normally follow here is an Honest God horror section in this game. Um, but... The devs are nice enough to understand that, hey, it's not for everyone, it's so very different from the rest of the game. Uh, they give you an option just to skip it, um, and the thing is, skipping it is also way faster. So we also just climb up the fire escape and skip it entirely. Um, but it is very intense, and unlike anything else that is in this game... One of these days, I'm going to learn how to actually speedrun that section so I can offer it as an incentive for marathons. Uh, so, we are just talking to some trees. There are five trees on the screen. Uh, you have to talk to them in a specific order. We did a couple before we met the dolphin. We're going to be doing a couple more now. We're going to make a detour over here to get this well-hidden card. Uh, and then we're going to head over to this fifth tree. 
and enter our next 2D area, which of course means another rhythm in the game. I haven't really talked too much about how these rhythm games work. Uh, essentially, it's just you hold the direction of the crystal to block it. Uh, for the gray crystals, you just neutral the D-pad and it gets automatically blocked. But if you're pressing anything, you'll get hit and knocked back. Um, again, there's no way to speed them up. There's only ways to lose time if you miss inputs. So they're essentially little mini auto scrollers. For a long time, the rhythm mini game track was like one of my favorites for whatever reason. It's it's pretty good for what it is. For a track that plays for like fifteen seconds at a time. Yeah. Uh, if you have played Anodyne One, this section may look familiar to you. If you want to understand what the link is between the two games, uh, so do I. And if you figure it out, let me know. There are theories. Yeah, theories, nothing confirmed by the devs as far as I'm aware. Uh, in any case, we are getting introduced to New The Land. We picked up a new trick in our Book of Tricks. We can now spark while we're in 2D to let us enter even lower resolution 2D, uh, as you saw there with that storybook. Now that storybook was a very simple section where if you read all the notes it gives you the backstory of this area um, and tells us, hey, you need to find these four armor pieces scattered throughout the land, is the short version. Um, now this is a very unusual 2D area compared to what we've seen so far in that it's kind of wide open, as you can see. Um, so we're kind of going all over the place. Uh, you might think that, that, hey, that would make this difficult to route. But the thing is, one of the things you have to do is there's these seven garish pink and purple blocks uh, that you have to, again, talk to them in a specific order. And that essentially dictates our path through this entire area. Because... We're just going to go in the order of those blocks and pick up things that are near them. Uh, so here we have a more traditional 2D section, uh, just in, again, lower resolution 2D. Our goal here is to deal with these pink diamonds. Uh, they can't be shot with sparks. They can only be destroyed by shooting a slime into them. These patterns are consistent as you enter these rooms, um, so as long as you get it on the, your first try, it's fairly easy to have a plan for them. Uh, you will have also noticed me inhaling some hearts. Uh, that's just what dust crystals look like when we're in lower resolution 2D. Uh, and we do need to pick up a handful of extra dust crystals. So that hopefully by the end of this area, our tank is full. Uh, I hope you found Waldo there. He was only on screen for half a second, but he was there. Uh, and now we get to meet Big Chunk and Slime. Oh, to be a big slime. Unfortunately, Big Slime is too big, and we have to uh, revert Big Slime to their inner child. Uh, by no. destroying their inner child and then destroying their outer child. No! Big slime! Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alright. So now we're gonna head over this way. Uh, raft movement is a little weird in this game. Um, so, there's two ways to move the raft. One is to use your vacuum cleaner, like you see me doing here. Uh, and the other is to 
walk into the edge of the raft. Walking into the edge of the raft is much slower, so I'm going to be using my vacuum cleaner a lot, but you can combine the two to actually do a little bit of diagonal movement. Um, it's just not very good diagonal movement, unfortunately. Uh, anyways, that was block number four. This is going to be block number five after we do this little shooting gallery. You have to wait for the uh, gas clouds around that old slime to dissipate, because they will block your shot otherwise. And then we're going to stop up here and climb the mountain. I actually really like this tune and wish it played for more than these six screens. I don't know, it's catchy. Uh, Alright, quick trading quest. Just... There's... Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, there's also the Green Sleeves remix that plays um, in the green ground areas. I don't remember where exactly, but that's my favorite. It has dogs barking in it. Yeah, no, it's pretty good. Uh, it's like this smooth... Oh, I did not mean to inhale that slime. Smooth Jazz remix of Greensleeves, which I thought was weird the first time I heard it. Here it is, by the way. Um, it really grew on me, though. It's like lounge Greensleeves, which I'm here for, turns out. Inspired right. game development. Now... Up there was block number six, and this is our final block, block number seven, and since we did it right, that gate opened. Now, you could go the long way around and get the hint about where this hidden item is, but we just know where it is. I can just grab it and leave. Alright, so if you've been keeping track, you know we have three of our armor pieces. Uh, we've got boots, we've got a shield, and we've got... A chest plate. We now need to go get the sword, which is our final armor piece down here. This is a maze. We're walking into the entrance with a dark tile before it will get you to the right entrance. Yeah, that that. The uh, checkerboard tiles are how you get through that without having to just brute force memorize everything. And then we're going to use these warp pads to take a quick shortcut back to the entrance of this area, which is where we need to turn these armor pieces in. Excuse me. And all of that cures the petrification of the prince there, uh, which is something we needed to do for reasons. I don't know, the prince just kind of comes in to kill Theo at the last minute. We do most of the hard work here. We're gonna head down into Dustra's lair. Dustra the Dust Dragon, um, who has inner ear problems, uh, so we're going to make them dizzy by just going in circles around them, like so. This is how I feel um, at 1 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, that sounds about right. What is happening? <laughs> and now we get our first boss fight in a while, and... Honestly, a really cool boss fight. I like this one a lot. It's got this sort of simulation of turn-based combat uh, by using the red line that you see coming up from the bottom of the screen. Oops, I hit the spike enemy there. I'll have to wait for an extra shot. That wave attack you can dodge by just either using one of the shields or just standing at the top of the room. 
will do the trick. But you have to be at the very top. And then, like I said, the prince comes in with the kill steal. But then, it turns out this dust dragon is actually a dust crystal and contains a card. And that is New The Land, which is... I just realized I never said the name of that area, but that's what it is. Alright. Now, at the end of that, we ended up with a completely full tank of dust. Uh, to get the good ending, we need a couple of things. One of those things is we need 150 dust in the prison. A full tank of dust is only 90 dust, uh, which means we need to go turn in that full tank and collect 60 more. So that is what we are on our way to do right now. Uh, do you want to talk about the other thing we need for the good ending? Oh, good ending. You need um, three pieces of a collar and its base. Um, and you pick those up from various areas around the island? This is an island, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I suppose it is. I hadn't thought about it much, but yeah, it is. I've fully forgotten all of the lore of this game. <laughs> but you need to you need to get the chest pieces, uh, chest pieces, the collar pieces from chests, and we've picked up one, yeah. I think, so far. We picked up one in uh, Desert NPC, in the Dolphin. Um, uh, sorry, just double checking my notes, make sure I actually know where I'm going before I start talking again. Uh, we didn't remark on it at the time, but some of these chests, when you open them, you'll hear a fanfare um, that tells you that you've picked up a collar piece. Uh, there are three collar pieces. There are five chests that can have collar pieces in them. Uh, the first three that you open have those collar pieces. The other two have extra collectibles that we don't actually care about. Um, so we just pick up the three chests that are the most on our way. Um, Get on the cactus, please. Talk to the skeleton, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just setting up for the next 2D section here. You gotta talk to the gum golem and the skeleton. Uh, they are a loving couple. Uh, and we're gonna go... They're gonna go invite us into our, their house. Uh, like... We're gonna drop in. Literally. And it turns out their house is very sick, and they need us to do something about that. By the way, for fans of the Rhythm minigame, this is the last one in the run. Godspeed for the minigame. And it's got two inputs, neutral and down. Apparently two inputs was too complicated for me, but it's fine. We made it through. Uh, this is the Loquat Skullgum. Um, it is, in my opinion, the hardest 2D section in the entire game to speedrun, barring maybe the finale. It's really hard. Uh, so the gimmick here is you've got these gum blocks and you've got these bone blocks. And if you shoot the bone block at the gum block, it makes a bridge. And you have to use that in clever ways to get to where you need to go. Um, moving the gum blocks around, uh, pulling them with your vacuum is fastest. Uh, pushing them is also fine, but don't try to push it when you have something in your tank, because that is extremely slow. Gonna just grab a little bit of extra dust there. I remember my pathing through this room. Get the fast cycle there. Grab this key. And now these keys try to run away from us, so we have to actually 
go hunt them down and talk to them again in every room uh, back through the path. But first, we're going to take the side path, because at the end of the side path is, you guessed it, a bonus card. Push that. Head up here. So yeah, you can just see we're having to strategically build bridges to get across. There's our key, uh, key card, our card that we need to continue. And our key is catching up because it can't take the teleporter. But as you can see, it stops again. We have to shoot another bridge at it. And it's going to stop again in here. And it's all very obnoxious. This one in particular, you have to you have to have that gum in the bottom corner to actually make that bridge. And we're just going to shoot across here. Good news is the key will automatically turn itself in. Uh, right. Sorry, just forgot what I was doing there for a second. Sure, I'll take that one. Uh, okay. Hello, game. Let's collect all this dust at least. Teleporter, and then another one so we can actually reach that slime. We gotta use the vacuum to position this precisely, and then to the left. And here we've got our gum key. And again, it's trying to run away from us. And it tries to run away from us again. And one last time. All right, we made it through. We made it. And now for an extremely difficult dodging section, by which I mean If you stand right here, the door will protect you from most shots. Uh, you'll take three hits of your six health, and then the segment will be over. Is it the same every time? Mm-hmm. Yes. No RNG to this. It is the same every time. There's our three hits. There's the segment done. That chest, by the way, has a collar piece if we were to open it, but uh, there are more convenient ones to get. That is too far out of the way. When I was doing like a small glance over the notes for this run, I definitely messaged Code Gorilla like, hey, why don't you get this chest piece that's so close to you? They're, they're the closer ones. Yeah, it turns out uh, the one that we're going to get here in Orb and the one that we're going to get in um, Pastel Horizon are both you're basically next to them just doing your normal routing. Uh, this is Orb Sector 4-16-5. Uh, it's a peaceful little set of apartment buildings. Um, the floating head wants to get through the gate, but needs favor tokens. Uh, so we're going to actually talk to that fashionista, uh, that fashion designer there, and... Uh, run some errands for them in order to get those uh, tokens. And that jingle you just heard there, that was a collar piece. That was our second one. So there's specific doors you have to talk to in order to get the fashion order. And then you come back here and you turn it in. And the thing is, 
Everyone tells you what they want, but we know what they really want. You know what's in this season? Pink sandals, white shorts, uh, a white t-shirt with a heart on it, and a baseball cap. That's the outfit Savage. that's really in right now. Revolution revolutionary. And it's not at all because those are the fastest clothing items to pick up. As much as I would like to do the bare paws and underwear and trash bag poncho outfit, uh, yeah. it's just slightly faster. The traffic cone, the traffic cone hat. The traffic cone hat is also very good. And we're just going to walk all the way to the end of this row to get that card. Climb back down to the fashion studio. Uh, one thing to note here is rubbing against a wall in this game slows down your movement a fair amount. Um, and the thing is, the pathways here are extremely narrow and it is extremely easy to accidentally rub against the wall. So you'll see me doing these little tiny micro adjustments as I go through um, to try not to slow down any. Because every each one of these stairs is actually just like a diagonal movement you have to put in. And then, I didn't comment on it all the time, but we opened this gate here from the other side a while back. And that's exactly so that we can take this shortcut right now. We've got one more pause glide uh, coming up here, so minor photosensitivity warning. That right Shout there out. was the collar base. Shout out to the boat area where someone's desperately trying to figure out what in God's name a boat is. <laughs> They'll get it one of these days, I'm sure. They'll figure it out. I have faith. We believe in them. Anyways, here's a weird thing on the beach that we're gonna poke at. Uh, it's gonna take us right back here. And you might think, wait, why do you need to be back here? You were just here. Well, the thing is, we were just here, but this portal wasn't active until we came in through that entrance. This is Pastel Horizon. Uh, and honestly, this area is the biggest reason I like running all cards, because I love this music. I love the whole vibe of this area. It's another uh, open 2D area, like New The Land was. I don't know what that momentum was. That was strange, but it was fast, so I'll take it. No complaints. Uh, we were following a pale, uh, pale, a trail of rose petals there. Um, if we had followed it any further, we would have been chased out by ghosts and kicked back to this machine, um, where we need to turn on. The anti-ghost machine. I don't remember exactly what it is, but we hit that lever and the ghost won't bother us anymore. This area of the game is the one area that, like, if you ask me what the plot of it was, I could not tell you. I'm so sorry, I just do not <laughs> know. Uh, I vaguely recall. Um. It's thematically, it's a bunch of stories about putting people to rest. Uh, there's a lot of afterlife metaphors going on here. Um, a lot of these, you know, inanimate objects we're entering uh, have spirits in them. And we're trying to help them reach rest. Uh, Uh, by the way, we have 60 dust, which is where we need to be, which is good. It means we won't need to grind any. Uh, the 60 we have now, plus the 90 we turned in earlier, is the 150 dust we need for the end of the game. 
We've got one card here. There are two more to get, and we're also going to pick up a collar piece. Got to talk to that NPC to get a memento of another NPC that left this island community recently. And now I'm going to do just a whole bunch of diagonal movement here, and if I do it right, I should just barely skirt the edge of this island here. Perfect. Because we need to actually go over here, do some kind of precise raft movement to get in. And because we have this memento, we can actually enter here and find another spirit at the end of this 2D section. I'm supposed to go up first, not down. It's fine. Shot too early there. That's fine. Made it through. Now, something very important here. First of all, you need to talk to this NPC. And you absolutely need to remember to actually go up this mountain and collect the card at the top. Uh, don't ask me how I know how important that is. <laughs> I may or may not have lost uh, more than one run to it. Alright, we've got our second card, and getting all the other cards in this area uh, unlocks an extra section, which we are on our way to now. Uh, where we take the trolley, and we get dropped off at this bridge to the afterlife, which conveniently has our third collar piece right there, and a card. And we should, I believe... Well, okay. There's technically one more card to get, but it isn't a card that counts on the in-game card meter, weirdly enough. Um, it's a plot card. Broken heart emoji. But we are getting close to the end of this run. Um, we've we've got our color base. We've got our 150 dust. We've got our three color pieces. Uh, what we need now is a reason to revolt, uh, essentially. We, we've started getting the idea throughout the game that the people that we've been working for, the, the center... Um, may not have our best intentions or the best intentions of the people at heart. Uh, and we're starting to get an inkling of an idea that maybe we should do something about it. Um, but we need more of an idea, and that's what we are on our way to go collect. You might recognize this tower. We are heading back to the dog. One, two... Three, four. Just head right on over here. And we're going to pet the dog. You must pet the dog. In fact, it's a dog so nice, we have to pet it twice. And then we put the collar on the dog, and that forms enough of a connection that we are allowed to re-enter Dustbound Village. Uh, but you might notice things look a little different here. Everything has been cleaned up. And almost none of the NPCs actually remember us. Fortunately, the one person that does remember us is right here. LGBT, or LGBT, uh, our, uh, our crush, as it were. Uh, and this is where we finally get the idea that, hey, we should do something about this. And maybe we actually can do something about this. So, let's go do something about this. We, of course, first need to... This time we don't get automatically teleported out of the tower, so we have to climb back down the tower. Uh, so we get to actually experience this tower with correct gravity for once. 
Uh, by the way, these jellyfish here floating in the air will actually uh, act as spring pads if you land on them, uh, which is slower. So we just avoid them on our way up and down. And yeah, yeah. In the ocean, there's, a, there's like a very brief section where you have to fall and avoid similar bounce pads. And we, I call that like a clean fall. And uh, whenever someone does the gravity spire, I'm like, oh yeah, it's a clean fall. <laughs> So we are just driving back to the center. Uh, we do have the total 150 deaths, but we need to turn a little bit more in. Um, something I learned while preparing for this marathon, you can turn in dust as a car, uh, which I did not know until relatively recently. Dust column doesn't care if you're a car or a Nova. And then we've got some dialogue options to button through. It's basically just a bunch of different ways of asking, of like, hey, are you sure you want to do this? But are you really sure? But are you really, really sure? And yeah, we are on our way to the final section of the game. Uh, say goodbye to 3D. We will not see it again until after the run is done. Um, also, don't hold any buttons or directions on the control pad during this entire cutscene um, because you may fall out of a cutscene trigger and get trapped in a black void. Again, don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> in any case, this is Zera, our placement, since we've gone AWOL. Uh, but we've actually snuck in here and have formed a connection and have do uh, shrunk ourselves into Zara. And so welcome to Nano Cleaner Zara. Uh, some of the best music in the game, one of the hardest 2D sections of the game, uh, the final 2D section of the game. Uh, of course, it introduces a bunch of new gimmicks. You've already seen the pink spikes uh, that get cleared when you shoot them and will damage you and enemies. Uh, we have bubbled enemies that cannot be destroyed until you shoot the bubbles off of them. And we've got the boomerang enemies that work like you expect the boomerang to work. Um, and you'll see all of these gimmicks explored fairly thoroughly here. Uh, I'm going the wrong way because I need to push these buttons. So yeah, we're just going to push around this invincible bubbled enemy to hit all the buttons. We've got a bubbled boomerang that we need to manipulate to destroy the spikes. Oh, I got hit there. Try again. Thank you. And our goal here is, you're, do you remember the elements of nurturing slash the elements of a balanced breakfast that we collected way back at the beginning of the game? Well, our replacement here also has some of those. Uh, and we want to destroy them because we are trying to free our replacement from the vicious cycle that is the events of this game. Um, so we're just going around here trying to destroy the elements of a balanced breakfast. To do so, we need some keys. So I've collected two keys so far. Uh, there's three elements. There's three keys. So count them with me. This area is also, like, really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. It's very easy to make some very costly mistakes, too. Uh. And, again, this is one of the other places in the game where your health actually matters. Um, a lot of the game, it doesn't matter that much, but you can definitely take a death here, and it will absolutely set you back. Especially because there's a couple of spots where my preferred method of dealing with them is involve some face tanking. Here's our first element of balanced breakfast, the element of a bowl of cereal. Uh, for the ones that move in a square pattern like that, you hit them with your vacuum cleaner to stop them in place, and then you just dump 10 shots into them as quickly as you can. 
Uh, and that is one element down. Coming up shortly here, we have the one other new gameplay gimmick introduced in this section. Uh, I refer to them as blood gates. They're these blood red gates that you open by taking damage. And of course the game makes it challenging to do so. As you can see, you have to do some work. Here you have to cleverly shoot yourself through the teleporter, like that. Uh, and then Hey, the snowmen are back. And this time we have to intentionally get blown up by them. And if you do all of that, you are left with one health here. But thankfully, uh, that is not at all a problem. Here's our second element, the element of regulated temperature. Uh, it makes squeaky noises when you shoot it and only takes one hit. And if you talk to the NPCs, uh, it makes you feel like you just kicked a puppy, you monster. How could you? But it's okay if it was an evil puppy, right? Mm. Anyways, we're using that bubbled enemy there as a shield. Just grabbing our last key. Most of the stuff in this 2D area is on the left side of the initial fork. Um, at the very beginning, I went left instead of right. And that's why, because all three keys and two of the elements are over there. And only one thing is over on the right side over here. And we've got some clever usage of uh, teleporters as we're going through here. We've got what's supposed to be a moral dilemma, but we kind of ignore it and just do the fastest thing. And, uh... Yeah. Again, we we have a revisiting of these baby slimes, which I never really talked much about, but if they get destroyed for any reason, a gate pops up to block your path, uh, and they are extremely fragile and will die to... So much as you walking into them will kill them. But in any case, that is our third and final element of a Melon's Breakfast destroyed. That is the element of a glass of milk. And uh, all that's left at this point is the final boss. Do you, uh, you want to talk about the final boss there, Daph? Um, yeah, the final boss is... The Glandalock Seed. Um, it has... It has a thing that it punches you with, and then you can shoot it back at it. Um, and then Nano Spark into it to... Um, and then Nano Spark into it to... Kill it more. It's very late. Uh, no worries. Uh, the key thing for the outside segments is you are looking to get it in six total cycles. So far, we're on a good pace. We got the first phase in two cycles. Uh, which is just how many times the boss makes that punch attack. Because, uh, basically each time it does it, you have to wait more. Of course, it gets harder for each phase, uh, you start getting additional projectiles, and the arm stays extended for a shorter period of time. These interior phases, the spikes always came come from the same locations, you gotta get six of them uh, reflected back at the thing moving along the top, uh, and it's pretty easy to get the same six every time. Alright, and here's phase three exterior. This is where it's hardest to get the two cycle. Ooh. Let's not die to the final off, please. Oh, I didn't quite get the seven cycle, or the six cycle. But we got seven, I just need to not die. Okay. Playing it a little bit safe there, and I'm gonna pick some health up here in this chamber. 
Uh, because I do use a damage boost in this room for the first hit. Alright. We are nearly done. So, that's that's it for the final boss. Uh, there's going to be some inhaling, a uh, horrible screeching noise, and then time is coming up very shortly. And... Time. Ooh, GG. GG. And that was Enter 9 2, Return to Dust, all cards, good ending. Um, there are a variety of different categories with the game, obviously. There's uh, any percent versus all cards, and there's good ending versus bad ending. So that's four different categories. This is probably the most involved uh, of the four categories that are on the leaderboards right now. Um... There's also technically a unofficial New Game Plus category, but I won't get into the glitches that make that possible here right now. Uh, I but about that. Yeah, th there's a way to beat the game in like 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's... Uh, we won't get into that right now. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to the Analgesic Productions uh, Discord, which is also, the speedrunning Discord for Anodyne, Anodyne 2, Even the Ocean, Stephanie, basically all of their games. Um, uh, a huge shout out to Daft for agreeing to do the commentary with me. Uh, and yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in and watching my run. Uh, Daft, is there anyone you want to shout out? Um, shout out to Code Gorilla for running this game. Thumbs up. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Um, well, okay, thanks to Code Gorilla for this run. Uh, if uh, you enjoyed this, uh, make sure to follow his Twitch. He still has uh, two followers up to 100, so make sure to check out his channel. Uh, and uh, our next run will be uh, uh, Five Nights uh, at Freddy's Security Breach presented by That Cloud. Stay tuned in this one.